reference quotes from him at drdisabilityquotes.com. So drdisabilityquotes.com. You'll see that along the bottom of your screen during our Facebook Live today. And uh, that's a good way to get some more information. He's got lots of great informative articles on his website. Uh, and then, of course, he's in the insurance industry. You know, he'd love to give you quotes and and uh, tell you all about these policies and answer all your questions. That's what he does for a living. So tonight, what we're going to try to do is simply answer your questions. Now, you guys are always a little bit slow starting with your questions, and that's not terribly unusual, and that's okay. Um, but we're going to start by just answering some questions that we've collected beforehand. And we'll give those, uh, we're going to give those to Bob to start with and let him just start answering it. But what we'd rather do, I mean, this is a live uh, Facebook event here. We want to answer the questions that those of you who are listening right now have about insurance. So you can type those right in as comments down below the link or, or down below uh, this Facebook Live, and we'll answer your questions. They'll pop right up there, and, and we'll be able to answer your questions for you. Um, but let's start with a few generic questions here, shall we? Um, Bob, you had just mentioned something to me that is news to me about Massachusetts. It turns out in Massachusetts, they're passing some regulations now that all policies have to be unisex policies. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, sure, Dr. Dahl. Well, let me start by thanking you for having me on uh, Facebook. And I want to thank your listeners for tuning in uh, from their busy schedules and um, spending some time listening into the both of us. Um, that is correct. So Massachusetts about a, a year ago passed, um, the insurance department passed a regulation where all policies issued in Massachusetts must be unisex. Now, there's there's a compact state um, group where if you're a part of the con compact, you can either opt in or opt out of the unisex rates. Uh, but if you're not a part of the compact, you most definitely need to comply with the Massachusetts regulations. So effectively, you've got two types of rates. You've, you've got gender distinct rates and you've got unisex rates. Now, when you look at um, gender distinct rates, they're um, 20 to 30 percent cheaper for um, male applicants than female applicants. And, um, you know, a lot of folks seem to think that that was rather unfair. Um, and Massachusetts passed this law where now all the policies issued in Massachusetts must be unisex. So, so far we have a confirmation that principle is going to unisex rates all, um, all throughout Massachusetts. Guardian is not going unisex. Uh, Ma Mass Mutual is not going unisex. Ameritas is going unisex and standard is not going unisex. Now, what that is going to do is that's going to lower the rates by 20 to 30% for female applicants, but it's going to raise the rates for male applicants by 10 to 20%. So for better or worse, this is great news for women, maybe not such great news for men, huh? Well, I mean, not really, right? So you've got choices. So you can go to a gender distinct carrier and still get the male rates with the discounts and pay a competitive rate. Uh, whereas if you're a female applicant, you'd be better served going to the unisex rate model. But what I like about it is it gives female physicians choices. Um, you know, in a lot of states right now, they don't have a choice but to pay this exorbitant gender dis distinct rate. Um, you know, which I feel awful, especially when it's a husband wife physician couple and the husband's rates are 150 a month and the wife's rates are 350 a month. So I kind of feel like it'll even out the scale a little bit in Massachusetts. I'm, I'm happy with this. Of course, it's only one state, right? If you're anywhere well, else, here's you're, the interesting it's not point. necessarily applying yet. Here's the interesting point. So everybody's watch, watching the Massachusetts model. Uh, you've got New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut waiting in line to see what happens in Massachusetts and, and possibly adopt the same model. Um, so, so it may become very widespread then. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Okay, so for those who are just tuning in here, I'm talking with Bob Bayani. He is an independent uh, insurance agent, primarily does physician disability insurance. And so we're answering your questions here tonight. Anything you want to ask about insurance, you can ask us tonight and we will try to get an answer to you. If we can't answer it right here live, we will get you an answer, um, you know, as soon as we can. Uh, but you can type those questions right in beneath this uh, beneath this video and we'll answer your questions as we go along. If you don't have any questions, we're just going to keep answering questions that have been sent to us in the past. Now, something I hear a lot, Bob, I hear that guardian's the best. People get told this, I don't know if that's by, you know, captive guardian agents, but they get told that guardian has the best policy. Can you talk about that? Because my understanding is that is not necessarily the truth. It is far more nuanced than that. Can you talk about the guardian policy and, and who it might be best for and when it isn't necessarily the best? Um, absolutely. Um, Jim, you, you know, guardian has been around the longest in the disability marketplace. So effectively, it was not even guardian that was around the longest. It was a company called Berkshire. And Berkshire created own occupation for doctors. Um, and, and that's where uh, the company built its reputation. But around 2000, Guardian acquired them. So they ended up absorbing that, that pro their products, their reputation, their experience. Um, Guardian has always been at the forefront um, of innovation uh, in terms of technology, in terms of um, product development and so forth. But they by no means are the only game in town. Um, now, recently, Guardian made a change um, and they introduced enhanced own occupation. So what enhanced own occupation does is normally when you adjudicate a claim, they look at time, duties, and income loss. Um, in, in the enhanced own occupation, what they have done is if you're deriving more than 50% of your CPT billing from a given duty, uh, which in, you know, is surgery or interventions, um, and you lose that ability, they will consider you totally disabled at 50% loss of income. So let me break that down for you a bit further. So if you look at a surgeon's schedule and his CPT billing, a surgeon spends no more than 30 to 40% of his actual time in the OR, but 70 to 75% of his billing comes from that duty. Um, whereas a surgeon spends no more than 55 to 65% of his time doing clinical work, but no more than 30% of his billing comes from that clinical work. So what Guardian does is they will disregard the amount of time you have spent performing a given duty, which is let's say surgery or interventions, um, and no more than 30 to 35% of the time. The fact that you've lost more than 50%, a source of more than 50% of your billing, they will consider you totally disabled which then would open the door for you to be able to work as a clinician within your own field, make any amount of money and still collect the full benefit. What other companies would do is they would not consider, uh, they would not carve out a distinction between your surgical and your clini clinical duties. So if you were working, um, not being able to do surgery, but working as a clinician, uh, some other company could make an argument, well, you're still working in the field of orthopedics, um, maybe not as a surgeon, but as a physician. So we'll, I mean, as a clinician, but we'll pay you, but we'll pay you partially. Um, so Guardian definitely has somewhat of an edge in their language uh, with enhanced own occupation, but that is uh, significantly specific for interventionalists, surgeons, um, not your general, you know, physician population. So I would, I would recommend um, your listeners to evaluate all their options, understand what each option represents, what is the option going to cost them, and then determine if it's worth spending, uh, I don't know, 30, 40% more to get that enhanced own occupation language. That's helpful. You know, speaking of own occupation, I get a question a lot from readers and listeners, particularly psychiatrists for some reason. 
that wonder, do I really need own occupation? Do I really need specialty specific coverage? I'm not an ENT surgeon. Do I really need that? I mean, if I'm disabled, so I can't practice psychiatry, so I'm not going to be able to do anything. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it's still important for those non-interventionalists? So I had I had a very interesting conversation with a psychiatrist, the same exact conversation that, that the same exact question that you posed. So his suggestion was, Bob, why don't you sell me a policy without own occupation, which will make the policy cheaper? Because I frankly don't see the benefit of an own occupation policy as a psychiatrist. So the first thing I informed him was that some companies don't even give you the option to opt out of own occupation. So Guardian, for example, bakes own occupation into their contract. Emeritus um, wraps up their own occupation with their enhanced partial disability rider. So it's not like you could just opt out of it. Principal, on the other hand, offers a regular occupation rider as a step up cost. Standard offers a regular uh, own occupation rider as a step up cost. So you could opt in or opt out. Now, as far as a argument in favor of a psychiatrist getting a own occupation policy, the point that I made to this gentleman yesterday was, so as a psychiatrist, um, you've got to ask yourself a question. If I got disabled, Am I going to sit at home or am I going to do something? I'm going to try and do something if I, if, of course, my body permits me to do so. Um, so. So then it comes down to, you know, who you are. So um, point number one being you're trained to be a psychiatrist. You're never going to make more money uh, in some other field than what you were trained to do. So if as a psychiatrist, you were making 350,000 a year and you got disabled, but again, you're not the type of person to sit at home and you decided to teach psychiatry, but now are making only a hundred to $150,000 a year teaching, what a own occupation policy would do is it would supplement that income and help you bring your income back to the pre-disability earning level. Um, simply because you're not going to be able to make as much money in another occupation as you did in psychiatry. Um, so that's really how I explain own occupation to a psychiatrist or a radiologist. That makes sense. Um, another question I've gotten is about residual writers. Can you talk a little bit about some real world examples of when a residual writer uh, would be worthwhile, worth buying? Sure. So residual disability rider is also known as partial disability rider. I feel that a partial disability rider is quite important um, to have in your policy. Um, it'd be a big risk not to have that rider. Um, so let me explain what the rider does and, and why it's important to have that rider. So what the rider does is it kicks in a benefit if you suffer a loss of income as little as 15% or 20%, depending on the type of product you buy. Um, so, you know, as they say, not all disabilities are, are total. Um, you know, a physician will do his or her best to continue working um, through an accident or illness and only file a total disability claim if and only if they must. So, Partial disability rider is significantly more used than folks realize. Um, so, so that's point number one. Point number two is partial disability rider wraps a recovery rider within it. So what the recovery rider does is you are totally disabled. Now you're transitioning back to work. I mean, it, you know, it never, it never happens that you're disabled totally day one and then going back to work full time, you know, the next day, um, you it's, it's, you know, a transition process. And in that transition process, um, even if you're back to work full time, but you're not back to your pre-disability earnings, your partial disability rider will make up the difference in income for you. Uh, or you're still practicing your own occupation, but you're just doing less of it because let's say your back hurts. Um, you know, now you're working a day less or you're seeing less patients 
and that results into a partial loss of income as little as 15 percent, um, that rider would start paying you a benefit. Not having that rider, you run the risk where you're if you're totally disabled and you go back to work earning very little amount of money compared to what, what you were earning before, that'll stop your benefit in its entirety. So, so I definitely feel that a residual rider is not something that a physician should compromise on. All right, let's talk for a minute about when to get disability insurance. I run into a lot of docs that uh, are, you know, senior residents, they're young attendings, sometimes they're halfway through their career and haven't purchased it yet. When is the right time to buy disability insurance? You know, you, you're the most vulnerable when you're young, right? So you, you got out of med school, you still haven't earned your first paycheck yet, you've got student loans. You still have you have to work your way through residency, um, and and to you know talk about when is the right time to buy disability insurance. The right time to buy disability insurance is when you are healthy. It, it, the right time to buy disability insurance is before something goes wrong, because half the phone calls we get is after something has happened. That's like looking for car insurance after you get into a car accident. Nobody's going to cover it. So I always counsel young med students and, and residents to get coverage early in their career by a small policy. You don't need to spend an astronomical amount of money, but lock in something, right? Because what these policies allow you to do is they allow you to go from 2500 a month of benefit to 20000 a month of benefit as an attending. So it's not as important where you start, whether you buy a $5,000 a month policy or a $2,500 a month policy, whether you buy a level premium or a graded premium to keep the budget manageable. Um, as long as you lock something in before you get some sort of a diagnosis. Because um, one of the things that I've noticed is that the lifestyle that the residents have, you know, they're, they're working crazy hours, they're not eating properly, they're not sleeping properly, they're not exercising, which makes them vulnerable for some sort of a diagnosis or some sort of um, um, symptoms, um, you know, back pain and so forth, um, to name one example. Um, you want to lock your policy in before something like that happens, because once you lock that policy in, it doesn't matter what happens to your health they have to guarantee you an increase when you're in attending. So I feel it's important for um, medical students and residents to lock in the coverage earlier um, rather than later because the, cl the clock is ticking against you, right? None of us are getting healthier as we get older, and, and that's where you run the risk of, of being declined for a policy because there's something in your history that the insurance company doesn't like. So I've always told people to do it when they become an intern. Basically, when they leave medical school, they're starting their residency, that's the time to buy it. But I understand there's even a few policies you can buy as a medical student. Uh, how much coverage can you actually get as a medical student? That is correct. So the insurance companies have come a long way in terms of uh, providing coverage for med students. So from what I recall a few years ago, a med student could not buy a policy till he was within six months of graduating. Well, that's no longer the case. Now a med student can get a $2,500 a month benefit while they're in medical school. Um, not many of them can afford it because they don't have a paycheck. <laughs> I, I'm amazed they'll give you disability insurance when you have no income to protect. Indeed, and, and if you think about uh, what a resident can get, a resident can get $5,000 a month tax-free. Now, if you look at what, you know, what, income some of these residents make, they barely bring home $3,000 a month. So to have a $5,000 a month benefit uh, would be a profitable situation right. for them. But uh, I don't know, I guess I wonder about the wisdom of buying it on debt too, because so many of these medical students, you know, if they're going to buy the policy, they're borrowing to buy it, uh, which brings in a whole other factor. Now they're paying interest for it. You know, that might be worth it though, to lock it in at a younger age particularly if you get disabled. I, you know, I, James, I would agree with you um, that I wouldn't go borrowing to buy a disability policy. 
Um, I mean, as long as you do it within a reasonable amount of time where you're not borrowing. Uh, I mean, for example, one of the things that I've done is when I've got med students contacting me in April, I tell them, why don't we plan this where we apply end of May, mid-June, so that by the time the policy gets approved, you'll be in residency and will have collected a paycheck. And let's start small. Let's start you with the med student limit, even though you bought it as a resident, almost as a resident, right on that border. And then once you settle in as a resident and you've got that steady paycheck coming in, then let's take that $2,500 policy and increase it to 4000 5000 a month. So I, I, I like to take that graduated approach. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of borrowing um, to buy a disability policy. It, it just financially, it just doesn't gel with me. So let's talk a little bit about pregnancy. Can you get a policy while you're pregnant? Is it even possible? Yes, you can. Um, so if you're in the first and the second trimester, um, you most definitely can get a, a disability policy. However, what the insurance company is going to do is they're going to put an exclusion, a pregnancy exclusion on that policy. Now, mind you, pregnancy is not a disability to begin with. Uh, but complications thereof are. Um, so I'll give you an example. I had a uh, fellow who in the third or the fourth month of pregnancy started bleeding. And um, her OB basically told her, bed rest, you can't be working. You got to take it easy. Um, you don't want to take any chances. And when her husband told me about this, um, I told him, absolutely, this would be covered. You need to file a claim. So we filed a claim for her. Um, she had the baby, uh, healthy baby. Mom was fine. Baby were fine. Baby was fine. Um, and she stayed home six months after the baby was born, and the insurance company paid for that entire time period. But if you purchase the policy during pregnancy, the insurance company, and it's an industry-wide standard where they will absolutely give you a pregnancy exclusion. Now, if you apply for disability insurance in the third trimester, they will postpone the approval till post-childbirth and 30 days after you get back to work. Um, so they do restrict it in the now, third trimester. Now, would that exclusion apply to future pregnancies? No, it wouldn't. So it's if just you, that pregnancy. Correct. So if you have a normal pregnancy, then you're able to go back to the insurance company and get it removed within 30 days um, of having the baby. But if there were complications, it may be harder for you to get that exclusion taken off for future pregnancy. All right, let's talk about military docs. What are their options these days? Is it still pretty much one company or, or who can they go to to get a true uh, individual disability insurance policy? So to answer your question, there are two companies that will insure military uh, physicians. One is um, Lloyd's of London and another is Mass Mutual. Now, Lloyd's of London is not a traditional disability policy, so that pretty much leaves you with one option, which is Mass Mutual. Um, now, the thing to keep in mind is that as a military physician, you have to be stateside in order for you to be able to purchase the coverage. Um, that's, that's requirement number one. So if you are stateside, um, then what you could do is purchase a $2,500 to a $3,500 a month policy, which doesn't sound like a lot, but what Mass Mutual allows you to do is it allows you to buy a multiple of three in future increased options. So if you purchased a $2,500 policy, you can get another $7,500 in future increased options. So now you've got yourself a $10,000 policy when you come out of the military. Now, that's important considering that 80% of the military physicians that go civilian that call me have gone out on some sort of a disability. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything major. It could be something very minor. But the minute you admit to a private insurance company is that you're on, you're collecting disability, it just makes it that much harder to secure um, private coverage. Or if you've developed some sort of a chronic diagnosis between getting the policy and by the time you leave 
the military, um, at least now you have the option to take that $2,500 policy and increase it to 10000 as a civilian. Um, so the choices are narrow, but most definitely worth considering, especially uh, military residents who make almost double of what civilian residents do. Hmm. What about a part-timer? Can a part-timer get disability insurance? Um, yes and no. Depends on the company. So majority of the companies will not insure you if you work less than 20 hours a week. Um, there are a couple of insurance companies that will not insure you if you work less than 30 hours a week. Um, now, one other thing they do is when you're working part time is they strip the partial disability rider um, and they just give you the basic policy. And then once you go full time, then you'd have to appeal your way. Um, into a residual rider within the policy. Uh, but it generally, choices are sh less um, um, for someone that's working part-time. What about if you start out full-time and then go part-time? Not if an issue. If you buy the policy before you go, before you go part-time, does it still cover you when you're part-time? Is that an Absolutely. issue? Or how do they How do they look at it? Let's say you're going full-time, you buy a policy, you cut back, now you're only working two shifts a week and you get disabled, how much will it pay you? It will pay you the amount that you set when you were full-time. So let's say as a full-time physician, you were making 300,000, you got a policy for $10,000 a month. Now you had a child and you decide to spend more time at home with the baby and are working lesser shifts and now are making well, 100,000 a year, but you still have that $10,000 policy and you're still paying premiums on that $10,000 policy, you're 100% entitled to the full $10,000 benefit, regardless of your employment status. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about all these different companies. I mean, there's essentially what, five, maybe six companies out there doing true own occupation, physician disability insurance. What do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of each of the companies? Um, generally speaking, um, majority of these insured, the top five are, are very quality companies to do business with. So not much of a downside in terms of a worry, well, will my claim get paid? Your claim will get paid if you stick to one of the top five, uh, without a doubt. The differences come in. Um, you know, when you evaluate the products and you evaluate the riders. Um, so to name some um, examples, you've got enhanced own occupation with Guardian that we talked about. You've got um, enhanced partial disability with Emeritus and Guardian Premier, whereas you've got basic partial disability with Principal, Guardian Select and Standard. Um, you've got the future increase option units with Guardian Premier and, and um, Emeritus, whereas you've got the benefit purchase rider or the benefit update rider with principal, Guardian Select, and Standard. So each um, product represents um, a certain type of benefits and the pricing um, is reflected based on the type of benefits you're getting. So the higher the level of the reimbursement, um, the the more coverage you're buying, for example, unlimited mental nervous coverage is going to cost you more than a policy that has a 24 month maximum on mental nervous coverage uh, or has a basic partial disability rider or has the benefit update rider. Um, so overall, all the companies, all the top five companies are good. Um, they're highly rated, they're reliable, they pay their claims on time. Um, then it comes down to the individual physician to evaluate all their options before deciding uh, what is the best fit for them, because it's not a flat answer. It, it depends on your specialty. It depends on your state. Uh, it depends on your gender. Um, there are a lot of moving parts to disability insurance, which is where a evaluation due diligence becomes very important. Yeah, I understand the specialty can have quite a bit to do with it because one company might look at your specialty and put it in one category of risk while another company puts it in a different category of risk. I think because of that reason, emergency physicians often find principal policies 
to be priced uh, uh, quite a bit cheaper than some of the other companies. Are, are there any other specialties that, that seem really good with one particular company? Um, it, generally speaking, what a lot of these insurance companies do is either one, they set a classification for medical specialties based on their claims experience. So if they have had a negative claims experience with a given medical specialty, they will tend to give them a lower classification like a 3A, 3M or a 2M, I beg your pardon, M as in Mary or M, M for medical. Um, uh, whereas your pediatricians, your radiologists tend to get five and six M categories. Um, so so definitely, you're a hundred percent right that certain insurance companies offer better rates to certain medical specialties, specifically for ER physicians, principal prices out very well because their actuarial experience with ER physicians has been better than, let's say, Guardian, for example. Um, so when you compare same everything in terms of same benefit amounts, same riders, Guardian versus principal, principal may come out 20 to 25% cheaper because the rate classification that they're giving that ER physician is much better. Um, now, there's Emeritas, what they have done is they've introduced preferred occupation discounts, and so has Guardian. So uh, preferred occupation discounts are applicable with Emeritas to radiologists, pediatricians, oncologists. Um, Guardian, on the other hand, has a preferred occupation discount for general surgeons and internal medicine doctors. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, some companies will give you a more favorable classification and a favorable rate based on your um, specialty, which is where, again, your due diligence becomes very important that you talk to an independent broker, you evaluate all these different companies and writers side by side to see where are you getting the best value. Um, that, that's, that's very important. Now, doctors are busy folks. What's the minimum? amount of time and effort they can spend and get a good disability insurance policy in place. Someone comes to you and says, I want to spend as little time as possible, but get this in place. How long should they expect to spend? Well, you know what I tell them? I just tell them to go on whitecoatinvestor.com <laughs> and that just cuts down the process tremendously. And and uh, and the, the honest to goodness opinions and views that are on the website are extremely helpful to a lot of my readers, uh, a, a lot of my, uh, I apologize, uh, potential uh, clients that uh, contact me. And even clients that contact me that are not white coat readers, I direct them to white coat because of the abundance of information that is available. So a resource like whitecoatinvestors.com is a very good resource. An independent broker, a consultation with an independent broker, or even two for that matter, would be a very good resource. Um, you know, disability insurance is a lifelong purchase. It's not something you wanna rush through. Um, you, you want to take some time. Um, you want to understand what it is that you're buying. What are your options? You want to try and talk to independent brokers versus agents that are subsidized by insurance companies because they tend to push one company um, rather than give you a, a neutral uh, view of all your options. But I, I would definitely spend a bit of time before I make this lifelong purchase because you're going to own that policy for 15 to 30 years. Um, so you want to make sure that, that that little bit of time that you invest uh, will result into a good decision that could stay with you for the rest of your life. So, so it's going to take a while, you say. <laughs> you can't just do it in Not an that hour. Long. Not that long. I mean, mm -hmm. if they go on white code, I think a couple hours worth of reading would, would mm -hmm. give them a basic understanding. And a couple of phone calls with a couple of ind independent brokers would give them a very good idea. I mean, especially if they're talking to one of the good guys on your list. Um, you know, these guys will look out for, your, for, for their clients. Um, and, and that's where I feel uh, they'd be well served going on your website for information and for 
contacting someone like myself um, and, and some of the others that you have listed. So if you're just tuning in now, I'm talking with Bob Bayani. He's an independent insurance agent who is able to uh, hook you up with a good physician disability insurance policy from any company, which is really an important aspect when shopping for this critical piece of your financial life. But we're here tonight to answer any questions you may have. Feel free to type them right in there beneath the video, and we'll get your questions answered during this Facebook Live. So a lot of people wonder about these tests they're going to get in this physical, you know, this paramedic physical that you get when you buy disability insurance. What are they actually testing for? So, we, well, let, okay. So a lot of insurance companies have now made allowances for medical students, residents, and fellows taking no lab testing. So, so that's wonderful news for, for, you know, these folks that have insanely busy schedules um, that they no longer have to do a blood test to get a five or a $6,000 policy. And they would not even have to do a blood test in the future when they increase that policy from 5,000 to 10,000 or 5,000 to 20,000 a month, no questions asked, no medical questions asked, they will give you that increase. For attendings purchasing coverage that is more than six to $7,000 per month, they do need lab testing. And when um, the lab testing is done, typically the insurance company it does a uh, HEP panel, HIV test, uh, a drug screen, a nicotine screen, um, uh, we talked about a lipid panel. So those are some of the things that the, or sugar, they check for sugar. Um, so those are some of the things that the insurance company checks for. But again, that goes back to my original point that it may make sense for med students and residents and fellows to lock in their coverage and have to avoid taking a lab test. Um, what, what concerns me about doing a lab test is they check you for 64 different things. And, and if there's one thing that's out of place, that could end up, uh, you know, into uh, a higher premium, a surcharge, or even an outright denial. Um, so so I, I try to avoid a lab test as much as I can for my clients. Yeah, I've got a personal experience with that. When I uh, went to get term life insurance, I was actually trying to replace a policy I bought during residency. I needed a, a better policy. The one I had, truthfully, was not a good policy for me. And um, so I was trying to replace that. And I made the mistake of working out the day I had my urine test. And I had a little bit of protein in my protein urine in and, of course, urine. failed it. And so they said, forget it. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. And I was just because I did this big, heavy workout like 30 minutes before I had my urine test. And so I went and did another urinalysis. And that apparently convinced them that it was fine. But uh, it really doesn't take much sometimes for it to look really bad on those tests. In, in, indeed, indeed. I mean, you know, protein in the urine could be a sign of uh, malfunctioning kidneys uh, as right. far as the insurance company is concerned. But what, what the broker should really do in a situation like that is understand, talk to the client, you know, Dr. Dahl, what happened? Oh, I worked out. Okay, well, let me go back to the insurance company and convince them to give you two repeat urinalysis to prove otherwise rather than rather than letting the insurance company tag you as mm -hmm. someone that has high protein in the urine. Um, right. What about marijuana? A lot of states, marijuana is now legal. I presume they're still testing for it, though. How is that going to affect your application if you test positive for marijuana? They do not test for marijuana. They, they don't check, test at all for, for it. cocaine metabolites. They check for cocaine metabolites, but they do not check for marijuana. Uh, if you do admit to marijuana, majority of the insurance companies for life insurance will give you a smoker rate at the most, but not a denial. With insurance companies, with disability insurance companies, um, um, you have to be a bit careful about marijuana because the way underwriters view marijuana use um, especially for medical conditions, is that all traditional medicine has failed. There is nothing left to try but marijuana. So it's a last resort, um, you know, form of medication that you're, you're employing, uh, which makes them prone to decline your coverage altogether. So for life insurance, not an issue. For disability insurance, recreational use is not an issue. But medicinal use is a almost a guarantee it'll be declined. Hmm. 
Interesting. So you almost don't want a prescription for it. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. So what do you tell somebody that's like me that has a bunch of bad habits like rock climbing and scuba diving and stuff like that? How, how, what's the best way for them to get the strongest possible disability insurance policy? Um, well, there isn't, right? So the minute, <laughs> the minute you admit that you're rock climbing or scuba diving, they're going to ask you all kinds of questions. Do you use safety harness? Do you use helmets? How high do you go or how deep do you go? What certifications do you have? Do you use a buddy system? You know, how many dives did you do in the last 12 months? How many do you have planned? But bottom line is they're going to exclude it. Now, the good news is if at some point, you know, once you have children and there's no time to go rock climbing, um, maybe you contact the company and get that removed because once they remove it, if you start up again, they can't exclude it. But why would they remove it? They would say, well, if you're not doing it anymore, what do you care that there's an exclusion on your policy? Well, you know, the, what I would tell them <laughs> is then, then you shouldn't have a problem removing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess that argument yeah, goes both ways. I, huh? you, you know, right. So, you know, when... <laughs> When you're an independent and you work for your clients, you know, you don't take very easily to, you know, some of the BS that comes up, comes from an underwriter or an insurance company. You always, you know, kind of gather facts and stand up and, and, and fight on behalf of your client. And you'll be surprised at the amount of successful appeals that I have made on my client's behalf. You know, underwriter comes out and says, oh, a five-year benefit period with this exclusion and that exclusion. And I talk to the client, I gather up the information and, and I call the underwriter and explain it to them. And they go, okay, Bob, all right, sure. We'll give them a 10-year benefit period and we'll take these two exclusions off. And um, so it's like anything else you have to negotiate. Hmm. All right, we've got a question here from a watcher here, a viewer. Um, this one comes in from Samsonite, who's asking, will they test if someone is on an SSRI? What if you were on one in the past, but aren't any longer? So an SSRI or an antidepressant, are they going to test for that or just ask about it? No, sir. They're not going to test you for it. But what they are going to do is they're going to do a prescription scan. Right. So when you apply for disability insurance, they pull a prescription scan on you that goes back 10 years. So they're going to pick up every single medication that you were prescribed and you filled, not just prescribed. If you filled it, they will see it. And that is how they're going to know um, that you took an SSRI. Now, if you took an SSRI in the past, you know, one out of two applicants that we get has been on some sort of anti-anxiety meds or SSRIs, you know, through med school. Um, you know, the pressures of med school is drive enough to drive anyone crazy. So we see it very frequently. But, you know, the thing about SSRIs or anti-anxiety meds is um, the worst that could happen is they would give you a mental nervous exclusion. But then when enough time elapses, and by enough time, I mean two, two to three years, we could go back and file an appeal and, and get those exclusions removed. Um, this year alone, I have had 11 or 12 successful appeals where we were able to get those mental nervous exclusions removed. So, you know, if you took an SSRI in the past, so what? I mean, 60% of the American population is on SSRI. So it's it's not such a bad thing. So if, so if it's been six or 12 months since you took one, do they even, uh, they just consider you like someone who never took one or? No, they will give you an exclusion. Being that it's that recent, they will give you an exclusion. If you've taken SSRIs within the last five years, they will most definitely give you an exclusion because the biggest fear an insurance company has is a short claim. A short claim is a claim that occurs within two years. So once two years pass, then the insurance company sort of lets their hair down on appeals and allows you to appeal out um, something that is not recurred, right? Obviously, you, you shouldn't be filing an appeal if you had a recurrence uh, or another bout with depression or something like that. But if you've, in fact, you know, been clean, then you most certainly should approach your broker and, and say, listen, file an appeal and get this thing removed. All right. How about 
graduated versus level premiums. Which companies offer graduated premiums and who should use them if, if they can take them? Um, if they can get so them. Graduated premiums, also known as graded <laughs> premiums, um, traditionally offered by Guardian, though Ameritas, Ameritas has a watered down version of a graded premium. It's a premium that goes up every five years versus uh, the Guardian graded premium that goes up every year. Um, so why use a graded premium? So I know a lot of times I talk to um, young residents and fellows, Bob, I want the coverage, I need the coverage, but I can't afford it on a resident's salary. Um, Guardian is one of those companies that'll give you all the benefits, all the riders, all the options at a fraction of the cost, but that cost will inch up a little by little each year. I mean, no more than two, three dollars per month per year, um, but over time, it does add up. Um, so, you know, I've seen two mindsets. I've seen mindsets where I'm going to work hard, I'm going to save, I'm going to invest, and I'm going to become financially independent in 15 to 20 years. Um, and a graded premium may be perfect for you. Pay the least amount that you have to up front um, and, um, you know, carry the insurance till you reach FI. And, you um, then cancel the policy and then the graded premium will not hurt you. If anything, it will have saved you a lot of money. Um, on the, the the second type of a graded premium buyer is someone who wants to keep the coverage long term, but affordability still up front is a concern, whether because it's they're on a resident salary, whether you know it's because they have um, a lot of student loans. You know, start with a graded premium, stabilize financially on an attending salary, and convert it to a level premium uh, as soon as you can. Now, there are companies like Northwestern Mutual, for example, who offer a graded premium, but that premium is not convertible to a level premium. So that premium just keeps going up indefinitely. Um, where, you know, by the time you're in, you know, late 40s, 50s, you're paying an astronomical amount of money compared to where you started originally. Speaking of Northwestern, uh, this is a company that I haven't been super fond of, mostly because of their practice with whole life insurance that they seem to think is right for every physician out there. Um, but what do you think? Should they even be included in your search for a physician disability insurance policy? Um, this short answer, no. Uh, the reason is the fundamental problem I have with uh, a Northwestern contract is their definition of own occupation. Uh, I'm not crazy about it because it offsets the benefit dollar for dollar of any earnings that you have. Now, what is so deceptive about that contract is they use this term medical own occupation for doctors. So, you know, you're naturally thinking or your readers are naturally thinking, well, you know, I'm a med I'm in medicine, I'm a doctor. I mean, this is the best definition I could potentially ever get, but nothing is farther from the truth. Um, it's a terrific company, uh, but the but the definition is 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 not good. Um, you know, if you are not able to work as a surgeon, but you're teaching surgery, every dollar you earn would offset a dollar of benefit. I, that's not how own occupation is supposed to work. Um, it, it, there are some other issues with it. And one of the issues that I have with Northwestern products is that a lot of Northwestern agents use disability insurance as a, by the way, gateway product to a whole life sale. Um, that to me, you know, um, is a questionable practice. Uh, you know, disability in and of itself is such a specialized product and it's, it's uh, a lot more frequently used than a life insurance policy that I feel that a physician should have the best uh, disability policy, the best one occupation definition. And they should be dealing with someone who's independent, who's looking out for their interest uh, versus, you know, someone who's looking to sell you a disability policy just so that they can get their foot in the door so that they can sell you a big whole life policy. Uh, or a lot of times they even set you up with these one year renewable terms and then they come back and say, well, doc, you started at 
a premium of 500 and now look, you're paying a premium of 2000, you'd better convert this to whole life to stop these premiums from going up. Uh, I just have a problem with that, that, that those type of marketing um, techniques. So for those who are just tuning in, I'm here talking with Bob Bayani, an independent insurance agent, and we're talking all about disability insurance. So we're going to be wrapping up in not too long here. So if you got questions you want to ask of the experts, here is your chance. So type those in to the uh, Facebook group just underneath the video there. Um, we've got one question here. I'm not sure it got finished. This is from Near Mall. He's saying American Academy of Family Physicians and American Medical Association keep on sending me letters to get disability through them. It's not actually a question there, but I think he's asking, should I consider these policies in my search for disability insurance, the AAFP policy and the AMA policy? Yeah, so a lot of times we refer out business to AMA and uh, AAFP if they're not able to qualify for a private policy. So your private policy that is fully underwritten, guaranteed renewable, non-cancellable is the strongest uh, contract you're ever going to get um, when it comes to disability insurance. Everything else is is uh, inferior to a uh, inferior to a uh, um, private policy. So the issue I have with AMA or AAFP or any other uh, policy that is issued um, with no questions asked is their group policies, their certificates. You know, we call them a piece of paper. You have no rights of ownership. Um, you know, you have no protection against the insurance company canceling you, raising your rates, uh, changing the definitions, changing the benefits. Um, so your def your first step should be to try and get a private policy and uh, if you fail because of pre-existing medical history and you're not able to get insurance through traditional sources then as a as a last resort you definitely want to go to AMA or AAFP um you know, this way, at least you've got some coverage, but they definitely don't compare. Uh, and again, it goes back to that definition of own occupation. You're not going to get the strongest own occupation definition or true own occupation language um, in a association policy, which is basically a group policy. Now, a lot of these policies uh, these days seem to only pay out to age 65 or age 67. Is it even possible to get a policy anymore that will pay for the rest of your life? Yes. There's one company that offers a lifetime benefit, which is Guardian. Um, but what they have done is they've priced themselves out of the market. So if you want a 865 policy, let's say the premium was $100. If you want a lifetime policy, the premium is $500 so per month. And, and they, so they've priced it so outrageously that they've um, priced themselves out of the market. Um, I frankly don't see the benefit of spending a lot of extra money to get a 70 or a lifetime policy, because uh, I'm a firm believer in, you know, work hard, save, invest, and become self-insured. Um, you know, disability insurance is really, uh, you know, hope you, you never have to use it. Um, you know, that, that should be your overall outlook, um, you know, rather than looking at disability insurance as some sort of a retirement plan. Of course, that brings in the issue that if it's only going to pay until 65 or 67, you got to have something after that. And so when you're deciding on the amount of insurance to buy, you've got to consider not only your expenses, but also how much you need to save for retirement so that you have something else when you're 65, which would argue Absolutely. for a little bit, a little bit more of a, of a benefit than maybe you would have bought just to cover your living expenses. Correct. So, so you make a very good point. Um, you, you know, so rather than pay an exorbitant premium for a lifetime policy, uh, buy a slight bit of an extra benefit, put money in a retirement plan, put money in a savings plan. Uh, and if God forbid you do get disabled, that extra amount, a thousand, two thousand dollars a month can go into, um, a, a, 
savings plan or an investment plan, which then would grow till you uh, you turn 65 or 67, which then can supplement your Social Security um, for income replacement purposes. Yeah, certainly that seems to uh, uh, be a, an advisable thing to do, just to realize that there's going to be a big difference in going from living on $10,000 or $15,000 a month on your disability insurance benefits to living on $2,500 or $3,500 on Social Security when you get to age 65. Correct. It's just, it's just going to be a dramatic drop in your standard of living if you don't have something else saved by then. Correct. That's where I feel that having that. So, so the advice, you know, when I'm designing policies for physicians, I ask them, well, what are your monthly bills? So let's say they come up with a figure of $8,000. Then I tell them, well, let's keep in mind you're going to lose your health insurance if you're disabled. So let's fact, I mean, for a family, health insurance costs $2,000. So let's, let's factor that into the picture. Um, let's factor in a couple of thousand dollars of savings per month. Um, so that you don't retire in poverty when your benefit ends. Uh, but that still would be cheaper than to buy a lifetime policy benefit. Okay, we're starting to get a few questions rolling in from the viewers here. Uh, it's funny, it always takes a while for them to warm up and start asking questions. But one of these, I think, is related to what we were just talking about. Why would I not just invest the monthly amount into a 401k and keep my own dollars for disability? I think the argument there, I think he's arguing against buying a disability policy at all and just trying to self-insure that. And the problem is in the beginning, you don't have any money. You know, you don't have anywhere near the amount of money you need to self-insure the rest of your life. I mean, that's called financial independence. And you just don't have that a year out of residency. It takes time. Even if you're a super saver, like the physician on fire, you know, where he was saving 60 or 70 percent of his gross income as an anesthesiologist, it still took him eight or 10 years to reach financial independence. And until that time, if he had become disabled, that would have been a financial catastrophe. That would have been terrible. Uh, and so that's what you're insuring against. You, you really can't self-insure that with just a few dollars. You need a lot of money to self-insure against not being able to work the rest of your life. You spent a decade getting this most valuable you know, skill that you have, your most valuable asset when you come out of residency is your ability to earn money going forward. And there's basically no protection for that if you don't buy a disability insurance policy. So I hope that answered your question. I, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking or not, but I hope I answered that one for you. Let's uh, give this next one to Bob here. This is from Simran. Do you need a private policy if you have good disability benefits from your university? Um, so universities offer two types of uh, disability policies. You have the voluntary group LTD, and then you have involuntary group L LTD. Involuntary implies that your employer is going to pay the premium for you, uh, which tends to be your traditional run-of-the-mill group policy. It's not true on occupation. It's taxable. Uh, it's not portable. It's issued under ERISA law, which is, you know, uh, a very hard to fight uh, a claim denial uh, under an ERISA policy. Um, then you have voluntary um, coverage, which is offered by uh, the university. But even, the, even in that, there are different types of voluntary policies. They could be a traditional group policy, which is just a reflection of the employer paid group policy. There could be a GSI policy, a GME policy. Um, so it really comes down to what type of policy does the university offer? You know, the term good, um, good policy, you know, would depend on exactly what the policy represents. But as a rule of thumb, the strongest policy is a fully underwritten private policy. Everything else uh, in a pecking order comes below that. So it's really a question of whether you want to take that risk that 
you know, that policy is going to be good enough in the event of your disability. Or um, at minimum, you know. get it evaluated. Right. You know, have someone look at it. I mean, I get phone calls all the time to evaluate policies. And, you know, I, I take the time, I review them, I explain them to the clients. And many a times I have walked away, you know, telling the clients, listen, you have a good policy. There's absolutely no reason for you to cancel this, to change it. Um you know, um, don't be afraid to contact me and, and have it evaluated. I mean, just because you called me doesn't mean I'm going to try and push you to buy something uh, that's not in your best interest. All right. That's very helpful. All right. We've been going now almost an hour, well, about an hour now. So we probably ought to wrap this up. Uh, my plan was not to take Bob's entire evening up, uh, but just wanted to give you guys an opportunity to really ask questions directly and to get information you need about disability insurance. I don't see any other questions popping up uh, here in the Facebook group. So I think we'll wrap this up. If you would like to get a quote from Bob, the way you do that is you go to drdisabilityquotes.com. And if you go up to the upper right on that site, there's a place where it says request a quote and you can request a disability insurance quote. And all you got to do is put in your name, your phone number and your birth date. And it asks you where you're at in your career, you know, student or resident or attending your specialty, your income, and your health history. Basically just a place free form to put anything significant health-wise there. And he will get a quote to you. And you'll have a chance to, to really begin this process of getting the policy that's right for you. Anything else you think these folks ought to know about disability insurance, Bob? Um, you know, we, we discussed it pretty uh, comprehensively. I, I think whitecoatinvestor.com is a great resource of information. Um, you know, a individual consult with an independent broker like myself, um, you know, is a good resource. Um, you know, uh, again, it goes back to my original point. Get your coverage while you're young and while you're healthy and in training. Um, rather than wait till you're symptomatic or you get some sort of a chronic di diagnosis. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing is buy the policy. You need it more than anything else. You need a policy. You know, we get out into the weeds on all the various writers and all the various companies and their benefits and all that. But the bottom line is you need a policy before you become disabled. That's the most important thing. So Bob Bayani of DrDisabilityQuotes.com, thank you so much for sponsoring the Facebook group and also for doing this Facebook Live with us tonight. I thank you, sir. See you all guys later. Bye-bye.